my mama was a librarian. Seriously, seriously. She set me straight if I was too headstrong. Seriously, seriously. She'd sit me down and say, listen, son, when you sure you're right, you're probably wrong. Seriously, seriously wrong. Hello and welcome, everybody, to the Seriously Wrong podcast extravaganza. Oh, yeah, I was going to say experience, but podcast extravaganza is good, too. Actually, extravaganza is even better. It's, it's really good. <laughs> right, my you. compliments to you on that. It has more syllables than experience. But it kind of implies like more than one thing is happening at once. It's like a big like streamers and right. like over here, there's musicians, there's a magic show over here. Like an extravaganza isn't just like one thing that's really good, although you could use it that way. Yeah, I guess you want a bit more like sort of sensory overload, a bunch of things happening at once. Yeah, like yeah. An, yeah, an extravaganza is like a pleasing sensory overload surrounded in every position with just like more than you can even take in that's that's the extravaganza vibe okay well maybe it's just the seriously wrong podcast experience then no no i think we should we should aim for extravaganza uh, we can yeah we could try but now that we've set the bar so high as to what counts as extravaganza i don't know i don't i just don't want to feel like we didn't live up to it right yeah no we should lower people's expectations well we've got a great guest who's always really on point but he was recovering from an illness i'm a new dad was up all night we probably barely got this episode together. Right, yeah. And for the interview portion, I wasn't even there. So it was just you two carrying the whole thing. I think you did a great job, to oh, be honest. I've you. heard the but interview. But that's going to be a big disappointment to the Aaron heads. They're going to have to wait for these little <laughs> drop-ins. Yeah, I'm in the sketches. I'm around the episode, but not during the interview sections. But I think people are kind of used to that. It's not the first time that I haven't been there for an interview. I'm not always there. Totally. But the Aaron maniacs will be disappointed when we accept that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Aniacs. Aaron. That's what they call themselves? I think so. in contact with them? <laughs> no, I've just seen them. just seen around. Seen around them. the fan from the fan cams. <laughs> yeah, people trying to figure out how do we pronounce this Aaron Naniac. It's kind of, it's not the easiest thing, but it does roll off the tongue once you get, apparently to them. I don't know. It doesn't roll off my tongue yet, but. You know what I'm a maniac for is the writing of the late David Graeber. He's one mm. of my favorite authors and political theorist. And this week we spoke to one of my favorite video essayists, Andrewism, about David Graeber's newest of multiple posthumous books. Yeah, Andrew's great. We've done an episode with him in the past and we did a library economy Q&A live stream on his YouTube channel and some sketches in his library economy video. So I definitely recommend people going, checking those out, checking out all the videos on Andrewism's channel. There's a lot of great content there. Roughly, this book, Pirate Enlightenment, it describes a period of history in Madagascar during the golden age of piracy and makes the case that pirate cultures heavily influenced the Enlightenment and some of the first proto-Enlightenment experiments were actually done by pirates in Madagascar. There's also ways that the Malagasy cultures of Madagascar impacted the Enlightenment. There's a bunch of side arguments and, you know, Graeber-esque asides and anecdotes and so on the, that makes it such fun thought candy. But it was a really interesting book. We got an advanced copy of it, even though it came out a while ago now. Yeah, I haven't read the book myself, but from hearing you two discuss it, it kind of felt like something of a cross between Marcus Redeker's Villains of All Nations and The Dawn of Everything. Graeber's last posthumous book. There's kind of like threads from both of those ideas coming together. Having read both of those things going into this, it was definitely like an enriching, larger picture right. thing. Uh, but I think the book stands on its own too. Gives the relevant context when necessary. Right. But before we get to that, coming up very, very soon, I promise, if you're on the edge of your seat, keep holding the edge or keep sitting on the edge. The interview's coming soon. But before you can get more and more on the razor's edge of your seat, but please don't fall off. Yeah, don't go too far with it. If you need to scooch back a bit, that's fine that's too. Fine that's fine too. No yeah, one's going to be totally mad at you allowed. if you have to scooch back to stay on that edge. It's uh, better than getting an injury. If you get injured, you might not get a chance to listen to the whole show. Edge of your seat injuries are no joke. You might be getting rushed away in an ambulance and getting a $500, $600 bill for that, depending on where you live. So while you're there on the edge, we have a little bit of housekeeping we have to get into a uh, an announcement we have to make about our Patreon, which is that you can go to our Patreon uh, and support the show. <laughs> 
I guess it's not a new announcement. I don't know if I should frame that as an announcement. No, I think it's great. I think we should keep it. Um, <laughs> it isn't. It's an announcement it, of a type. Yeah, it's, yeah. Like no, it's an announcement of a type. Like it's n- not all announcements are breaking news. Um, yeah, you can announce something three hundred times in a row in every episode of a podcast if you want to, and still this is it an never ceases being an announcement just because yeah. people have heard it before. Like, oh, that's not an announcement. I've heard that before. Okay, sorry. So announcement one, there are bonus episodes up on our Patreon. We've had multiple bonus episodes just recently about Some great ones. eating bugs, about internet, uh, piracy. internet piracy. There's a two-part series on the Haitian Revolution so far. All those great bonus episodes and more, as well as getting non-bonus episodes early and getting access to our Discord server and Facebook groups. Yeah, and the whole back catalog. You know, there's 100 plus episodes that were originally released as a normal episode and we, we clawed them back, starting with the early ones. Uh, so we could put our best foot forward as we've learned how to do podcasting better. But there's still some great gems back there. And if if you like our show, you'll definitely find some stuff you really like in there. So yeah, head on over to our Patreon, sign on up, and uh, feel part of supporting the show financially. Yes, and a very special deep thanks to all of the beautiful, hilarious geniuses who already do that. Uh, You make our day every time. You're incredible. I think you're kind of like a beautiful genius, like Einstein meets Adonis kind of Hmm. thing. Yeah. Unless you don't identify with that and you want to identify something else, then you are what you want to be in this realm. But personally, from where I'm sitting, that's what I see. And without uh, further ado, on with the show. This episode was brought to you by Army Hearty's Financial Services for all your pirate loot management needs. Are you sick and tired of having looted a ship and having your coffers overflowing with pirate loot? Having no way to exchange it for something useful? Yar, I should be a trezillionaire, but I can't find anyone to buy me booty. Are you tired of not being able to enjoy your pirate retirement because you can't explain where your wealth has come from? Oh, but I earned it honestly. I did. You need a non-pirate third party who can help launder your ill-gotten gains into the economy. Because if you're stealing things from the most powerful people in the world and then trying to sell them, people are going to notice. That's where we come in. Army Hearty's Financial Services. Serving buccaneers, privateers, and everyone in between since 1650. I am joined today by Andrewism. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. And you? I'm doing good. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit early in my day, but I'm feeling refreshed. I drink some caffeinated beverage. Ah, good old caffeinated beverage. Yeah, it gets the job done. Never gets old. <laughs> So yeah, today we're talking about David Graeber's latest posthumous book, Pirate Enlightenment, or The Real Libertalia. We we talked about doing this probably over a month ago now. Since the beginning of this year, yeah. We got a review copy of the book before it came out. I was really excited. And then we had a series of delays, one of which was the birth of my child uh, and taking care of the, that kid. That would naturally delay things, yeah. Yeah, and then you got sick. And so, yeah, I guess but first off the bat, what's your um, sort of intellectual relationship with Graeber? How did you come into his works? How do you feel about his corpus, his collection of works? Right. It is extensive, is the word I would use to describe it. I mean, he's kind of known as the anarchist anthropologist. His work is really what kind of got me into sort of a hobby interest in in anthropology. And I'm actually considering studying it formally, at least as like a minor degree, taking a few courses. I think I really discovered his work with Debt, The First 5,000 Years. as the first book of his that I read in full. And when I say read in full, you know, that took some time because that book is dense it's dense, but it's really, really impactful. And ever since I read that book, I really fell in love with his style of writing. I mean, I know some people may not like how it sort of goes from topic to topic, but I find it really enrapturing because it sort of reminds me of my own sort of thought process and my own 
yearning and desire to explore and discover and think about a lot of different things at the same time. Yeah, for sure. I, I like the, the conversational ADD hopping around style too. And he, his books are so dense, like debt. I read it cover to cover at some point, And then I've went in and, you know, reread surgical chunks here and there or control F when I'm on another project. Exactly. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. And the same with this book too, Pirate Enlightenment. Like when I asked you if you would do this episode, I was like, oh, this is going to be a small little book, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> yes. this is a small by Graeva standards. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a short book. It's not that debt length. Uh, so I'm going to be able to get through it. So now I've read it. I've listened to it. I've reread it. And I, <laughs> I still feel like there's this huge gap between what the book says and what I know. I didn't even realize there was an audiobook to listen to. I wish I had known about it. Yeah. Similarly, like debt would be the first one I read, but I really became familiar with him through his public interviews around Occupy, which I was involved in Occupy Winnipeg. And Graeber was someone who is in the public eye making really sort of coherent, positive statements about Occupy. He, also, right. he did this video where he explained all the hand signals and stuff like that, which then I translated to the local camp. And then we started using the hand signals. It came to Occupy Winnipeg through a Graeber video that I saw. And we interviewed him on the show. And I actually, I got to meet him briefly from just a crazy coincidence. He was living in London. I was living in Vancouver. Uh, there's no planning involved whatsoever. But I went on a two-day trip to New York where I was visiting with some friends. And when I was in New York, I was like, it'd be so crazy to, I'm like going by the Wall Street Bowl and stuff, walking around. I'm like, it'd be so wild to run into David Graeber here. Like, I don't know why that occurs to me <laughs> when I'm walking around and Lo and behold, lo and behold, wow. I'm at Union Square Park and I run into David Graeber in the stairwell of the Whole Foods that I went into to steal their internet or to borrow <laughs> their internet rather. To radically distribute the internet, yes. <laughs> yeah, radically. And it turns out that he was in town also for like a day or two because he was getting married. And when I saw him in the the stairwell, I just like shouted D David, like I don't, we're not on first name terms. I don't, uh, but I'm just like David, and he like looks up at me, and so we had this brief conversation, uh, which was really cool. I didn't want to bother him, and it's always weird when you have that parasocial social thing being collapsed, right? But that that was late 2019, so just a few months before his death, uh, and yeah, I'm rest in peace to him. A huge loss. Yeah, um, definitely gone before his time. But yeah, he, Graber, I think is probably the biggest single person influence on my politics it's hard he's 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 up in the upper echelons anyways of like individual authors that i've read who have impacted the way i think because there's so much thought candy and just like i like that too i like that idea of thought candy because it really like when you think about it you, you read a chapter not even a full chapter like a section of a chapter in one of his books and it just you know it's like a lollipop you just sit in there sort of stewing on it for a while thinking about it and its implications and all those things. Pirate Enlightenment has been touted as a potential last book by David Graeber, but Cory Doctorow informs me via an appearance he did on the Everyday Anarchism podcast. He's on a committee of people who are sort of charged with stewarding Graeber's unpublished writing. And he said on the Everyday Anarchism podcast that this probably won't be Graeber's last posthumous book because he left so much writing behind. So that's good news. But yeah, I guess the concept of Pirate Enlightenment, this is a book I was looking forward to ever since I first heard that it exists. Like, I really like pirate stuff. And it connects to a lot of his other works. There's sort of the continuation of the themes from the dawn of everything about this alternate view of the Enlightenment. The European Enlightenment, not as something that's happening from Europe, like unfolding onto itself and like just this sudden outpouring of genius in Europe, but rather being a product of a global conversation of the entire world sort of being connected for the first time and conversations happening on every corner of the planet, which ricocheting across each other create a sort of intellectual step forward. I think we, we have a sort of a habit of taking historical continuums and multiplex elements and contexts and ideas and processes and isolating them, putting them in these bubbles. And that's sort of the product of the education system, right? It's like you taught history in chunks. Here's your historical lesson on the Enlightenment. Here's your historical lesson on European colonization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There isn't as much effort 
there is some, but it isn't as in-depth as I would like it to be, to sort of connect the threads of all these different sort of quote-unquote isolated subjects into a more cohesive whole. And what I like about Graeber is that he will tie threads from all over the world into one sort of, it really gives you the sense that everything is connected in history. Yeah, I think in his essay, There Never Was a West, he talks about the so-called Western intellectual literary tradition as being defined by, it's like looking at history as a series of inventions and discoveries. Their framework is always like, when was this invented or when was this discovered and who was the guy who invented or discovered it? And so like, if we want to, <laughs> if we want to talk about something like democracy, the traditional sort of common sense way to look at that is like, okay, well, who was the guy who invented democracy? Where was it discovered and invented? And how did it come from that guy or those guys who figured it out? And the typical story is that it was invented in ancient Greece. So you're telling me the democracy wasn't invented by a guy named Demos Crossy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, there was this guy named Democracy, and he was like, oh, what if we all tried talking together to solve problems in a collective context? They're like, oh, you're a wild man, Democracy. Oh, you're genius. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he makes the point kind of unfolds in the in the essay that democracy was named in ancient Greece, but any reasonable looking at the way that people interact with each other you would notice that the process of collaboratively coming to decisions of using things like consensus and discussing things face to face to try to come to conclusions reasonably that's got to have existed all over the world throughout human history. This is one of the basic units of politics, people coming together to have conversations and come to conclusions. Exactly. It also kind of reminds me like the idea of the Greeks just putting a name to democracy it reminds me of something he talks about in debt, which is basically the name communism is just sort of putting a name on aspects of the human experience that are already being expressed, you know, hence his term everyday communism. Yeah, that's such a cool idea too. The everyday communism framework is something I was just thinking the other night of how much this impacted my thinking on sort of like library socialism and, and what the benefits of pooling resources and coming together are like you're on a work site with other people there's a limited set of tools can you hear my baby crying yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's a limited set of tools you're like hey pass that hammer and no one's like all right well if you want this hammer it's going to cost you they just pick up the hammer and they hand it to them. And the reason you do that is because everyone is collaborating on this larger project. And so that's kind of an example of what he talks about as everyday communism, which is like this, this social space, this social communal space between people where it's just taken for granted that, you know, when you're at the dinner table, you pass the salt that someone asks you. There's no, <laughs> there's no fees. There's no requesting money for it. And yeah, I, I found that idea really powerful in reframing just thinking about how much of this like these social dynamics of sharing exist in our day-to-day -day lives already but yeah most most people aren't bold enough to call it communism so yeah the, this book is about pirates and i was wondering how you feel about pirates have pirates ever been like a thing for you when you were a kid and stuff like yeah pirates so i, I could make a joke and get you cancelled and say, oh, are you just asking me that because I'm from the Caribbean? But I will <laughs> I'll put that aside and say that, yeah, pirates are definitely a thing. I never watched the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, but, you know, this is kind of part of growing up. You have like a sort of a phase for pirates and you imagine being a pirate and all these different things. Of course, pirates are so... <laughs> heavily sanitized in children's media. You don't really get to think about the implications of what it is pirates were actually doing um, in real life and in real history. But um, yeah, it is something that we played around with, experimented with, and thought about. You know, you see pirates in Pizza Pan and all these different movies and shows, and it's just, it's a staple, kind of like ninjas. You know, even have like ninjas versus pirates as like a topic of, of debate among the young yeah actually in trinidad there must be local histories of pirates is there any way that that's ever sort of reflected in 
say like the history of Trinidad that's taught or is there any is there any specific sort of pirate history that you're aware of? We're kind of in the corner of the Caribbean, right? We're kind of like tucked next to Venezuela. A lot of the action was happening, a lot of the pirate action was happening around like Bahamas, Jamaica, Haiti, Cuba, sort of the more northern Caribbean islands. But I not to say that nothing was happening here. Trinidad was a, sort of a smuggling hub, particularly under Spanish rule. Our capital is called Port of Spain, right? And Spain was the first to really control Trinidad as a colony. But Spain wasn't very good at colonizing Trinidad, which, you know, it's a good thing, I would suppose. And so they actually couldn't get enough settlers to come to the island. So despite being controlled by the Spanish, it was definitely a very multinational, the, the colony is a very multinational endeavor in terms of its settlement. And eventually Spain and France came to an agreement. So a lot of French settlers came from other Caribbean colonies with their slaves to settle in Trinidad by, with, with favorable land grants and stuff because Tr Spain really wanted to settle Trinidad, but they couldn't attract you know, Spanish people to do it. So Trinidad ended up in a situation where it was Spanish controlled, but the language on the island itself was predominantly French. And for a long period in its history, the Spanish, they didn't have enough resources to control Trinidad specifically, or to effectively manage it. And so there's a lot of smuggling activity happening in the ports. And a lot of sailors of various nationalities would come and settle and trade and sell their resources and stuff. Eventually, of course, Trinidad would fall under British hands. Interesting. So yeah, I guess with smuggling being like an economic factor, then the, the chances of there being sort of pirates, privateers involved is pretty high. For sure. I mean, even um, one of the more famous pirates, Blackbeard, Edward Teach, he was known to raid the coasts and the shipping lanes of both Trinidad and Tobago. Oh yeah, that's a big name pirate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a pirate celebrity. But I didn't really hear much about pirates in Trinidad's history. Like even when I would visit the forts and stuff around the island, the historical explanations and stuff were mainly focused on the forts as defense from other, you know, colonial empires, not necessarily like a ragtag group of pirates, you know? Oh, that's really interesting. But yeah, so uh, for people who don't know, on our podcast, we recently spoke to Marcus Redeker. He's a historian of maritime history um, and pirates. And we talked about a, a bunch of things about pirates, but the really interesting sort of top level thing here that's also a key element of the Pirate Enlightenment book is that the pirate crews during the golden age of piracy, which is also the sort of period of time that Pirate Enlightenment deals with, they were in a lot of ways very egalitarian in their politics. And in some ways, and this connects to the Pirate Enlightenment thesis, in some ways they were kind of prefiguring or they were using political forms that became much more common in the period of the Enlightenment, like ideas like counterpower. Um, where you have elected captains and elected quartermasters. And there's kind of a tension on the ships between a quartermaster who deals with money and deals with like procedure and captains who deal with directing people during raids and battles and so on. There's kind of a dynamic tension between them. They're both elected roles. And then they, they both have different areas of specialization, but neither one is above the other. So there's kind of like this counterpower idea within the sort of egalitarian pirate structure, this countervailing tension between them. And also pirates during the golden age of piracy, they had directly democratic ships. Their systems of distribution were based on shares where pirate captains only got slightly more than the crew and everyone else split out the booty equally. They were bound by collective contracts or individu and individual contracts, basically like a, the pirate code is like a charter. So all these things together, so this is the early 1700s, you have a political force at sea, which is very egalitarian compared to the dominant hierarchical structures of like colonial society. And Graeber points this out. And one of the things that he's saying in this book is that it's not a coincidence that a lot of these ideas became popular in the Enlightenment in the period leading up to the French Revolution in the age of revolutions elsewhere. It's not a coincidence that that happened in the time period right after you have this global explosion of piracy. And the kind of theory is that these pirate practices influenced 
the development of these Enlightenment ideas, and also in particular, the idea of like a pirate kingdom, a pirate utopia in Madagascar captured people's imaginations and helped create the, the sort of fertile ground of conversation that then led to a lot of ideas that we'd recognize as sort of common sense today in the, the post-Enlightenment period. Yeah, it's really, it, throughout the book is very interesting to sort of explore that legacy or that lineage rather of ideas and how they were interpreted and reinterpreted across different contexts, across the seven seas. And particularly, as we see in the book, in the context of Madagascar and, and its pirate history. Welcome to Keyboard Warrior Radio Theater. Has anybody heard of this utopian pirate colony, Libertalia? It sounds amazing. They were directly democratic. It's like the true liberty of the people, like being against monarchies and just kind of doing what you want, being comrades to the people. Hey, Chris, uh, I don't know why I expected better from you, but you should really check your sources before making a post like this. It's generally considered by most experts in the field that Libertalia never existed. It was a mythology. It was something that was created by lying pirates passed into the book, The General History of the Pirates. But there's there's no contemporary evidence of any of the figures involved in it, and there's no archaeological site that's associated with it. So all in all, you've been duped again. Oh, I thought I blocked you. Why are you on my page again? Look, I don't care what the quote unquote experts say. They have an anti-pirate bias now and they always have. Look, the pirates who settled Libertalia are vigilant guardians of the people's rights and liberties. And they stand as a barrier against the rich and powerful of their day, led by Captain Mission. They're real. I don't want to hear your sources and evidence and whatever. You're always pushing the mainstream narrative, and uh, I don't appreciate it on my page. Jeez, I mean, you would really believe anything. All you have to do is say, this goes against the mainstream narrative. This goes against the experts. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, really? Tell me more. I'll believe anything as long as it goes against the dominant theoretical experts of people who are actually know about oh tell me more mm, more slop for the pigs in the trough that's you you're you're a pig eating slop in a trough you're like ooh yum more lies more wonderful lies when i read your posts that's what i what i see the only one of us eating slop from a trough is you the gruel that's being fed to the masses that you just slurp up and i on the other hand turn away from the gruel and look uh, for the feasts that lay elsewhere but require a bit more critical thought libertalia existed they created a new language and operated a socialist economy they're real uh no sir if there's anyone eating slop from a trough here it is you slop trough eater you the you story your biography is called how did i eat the slot from the trough by you autobiography that you wrote period actually guys the real tea is that pirates never existed look it up really pirates never existed could you tell me more i did the research it's all one big hoax it's this whole conspiracy by the Walt Disney Corporation to sell more Peter Pan movies and remakes of Peter Pan movies and spin-offs of Peter Pan movies and remakes of spin-offs of Peter Pan. The point is, it's a whole pyramid scheme meant to just create this narrative within the population's brain that pirates ever existed when they didn't. In reality, the only cool people that ever existed were ninjas. Hashtag open your eyes, hashtag wake up, hashtag stop eating the slop from the trough. Well, there is a new Peter Pan movie coming out, so I mean, that's pretty convincing. There always is. That's the beauty of the scheme. There always is. And what do you have to say to that? Are you going to argue there isn't a Peter Pan movie coming out? Look, I'm just saying I'm not convinced that there's a new Peter Pan movie coming out unless I have good evidence, something like a trailer or a poster. I can't just go off of word of mouth like this. 
blocked. He's gone. Should have done that months ago. Now that that's clear, can you tell me more about this pirate conspiracy? It all began in 1953. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Keyboard Warrior Radio Theater. Yeah, so the subtitle here, The Real Libertalia, it refers to this mythological utopian pirate settlement that was, it was a rumor, it was a myth, but it was also potentially intentionally spread as misinformation by pirates. One of the things he says is that pirates used narrative, tall tales and misinformation as weapons of war, that they were, by misinforming people, the pirates were able to strengthen themselves in the world by creating the perception of themselves being bloodthirsty and dangerous on the seas, but in the context of settlements in Madagascar, being able to represent themselves as serious, coherent, structured, even in places where they weren't. What's interesting about that, and the fact that they were able to pass themselves off as like ambassadors or representatives of fully fledged independent nations, is now we kind of have the opposite situation where I've heard stories and I've had people that I know experience it, where they've visited Europe, for example, or parts of Europe, and the border control officers, the customs officers that they're dealing with, they look at the passports and they ask them if that country actually exists. Like they've never heard <laughs> of Grenada or Trinidad and Tobago before, you know, which is kind of funny because you know we have access to the Schengen area. But it's just interesting to see how that's changed, how borders as a concept have changed, where you've reached a point now where you've gone from people could make up countries and pass them off as real countries to now real countries are being seen as fake by people who haven't looked at a globe, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. You think if you're going to be, well, I mean, the reality is, I guess, if you're in border enforcement, it's because... <laughs> It's not necessarily, you're, the, the most worldly people aren't being selected for border enforcement in all likelihood. Sure. But you'd think that you would know, have a basic idea of roughly the nations of the earth if your job is to look at passports. On the bullshitting about a pirate colony thing, one of the most interesting little tidbits of the book around that is it was a really common thing apparently for pirates to lie about where they came from or people to claim to be pirate kings. And there was a sort of growing common sense idea in European political theory that that the start of a nation was basically a plundering pirate king putting down a flag and then being like, this is ours now. And they theorized seriously that that was probably the origin of nations. So pirates or alleged pirates were able to play on that conception or misconception. And there was someone who was claiming to be a pirate king of Madagascar who was entering in negotiations with the nation of Sweden, basically to have a <laughs> to have a treaty between a fictional nation and Sweden. He gives a number of other examples too of like uh, the Russian czar was trying to make good with the pirates because they wanted to set up a Russian settlement in Madagascar. It seems like generally in this time in the golden age of piracy, you have a lot of people who either are pirates or are claiming to be pirates, claiming to be representatives of this big pirate kingdom. And so it seems like through the, the telephone game at the time, that was transformed into this idea of Libertalia, which was written about in A General History of the Pirates, which is generally considered correct. It, it correlates strongly with other contemporary evidence. But the specific claims about Libertalia don't stand up to scrutiny. People who are claimed to be involved don't seem to exist, and there's no archaeological sites that would match to it. But that isn't... The, the non-existence of Libertalia doesn't change the reality that pirates did indeed experiment with new forms of governance and property arrangements. And it also doesn't change the fact that Madagascar was one of the places where that was really popping off and it really shaped the history of Madagascar. Yeah, there's a few sort of real Libertalias that he lists off in the book over time as well. There was a pirate settlement called Ambinavola. Founded in 1703, the leader of Ambinavola was a former pirate ship captain who was elected pirate captain of this settlement. And it was very explicitly about taking the kind of logic and forms of the pirate ship and bringing them onto land. And then 
later down the road, I think 10, 15 years later, there was the founding of the Betsy Mitsikara Confederation, which is also a kind of real libertalia. And it, it seems to have been founded by the children of pirates and the pirates' Malagasy wives. They formed a confederation, their own sort of libertalia. They had someone who claimed to be a king, who was the son of a pirate, but he seemingly didn't actually act as a king. They worked in a directly democratic way, not unlike pirate ships. Um, and they also built not just on pirate culture, but inherited Malagasy customs as well. So there, there was kind of a real libertalia. They were sort of organized democratically and horizontally, but they claimed to have a king who was a pretend king. And the parallel that is drawn is to the sort of captain of, of pirate ships. So the captain of a pirate ship, it's a democratic thing, but you have this captain who can then front outwardly as this bloodthirsty leader and work within the logic of this hierarchical system uh, while actually functioning democratically. So that's one of the sort of theories that Graeber puts forward. It's kind of like this, this idea, uh, I believe it's a wrestling term called kayfabe, right? So it's kind of like, so in, in professional wrestling, Kefi was this portrayal of staged events as real or true, right? So they portray, you know, these characters, these rivalries, these relationships as like an actual, like it's a whole performance that they take on and they, they really play it up for the audience. But in reality, you know, wrestlers are basically actors. So it, in a sense, I feel like there's this sort of persona that these pirates kings quote unquote are putting on is they're coming off as these like ruthless and bloodthirsty leaders who you wouldn't dare cross him but in reality you know he's on equal footing with the rest of the of the crew and he only has his position based on you know their consent yeah it's an interesting comparison the the fake wrestling thing of like i'm the fake tough guy pirate captain and i brutally subjugate my crew but then actually behind closed doors, when they're not being sort of seen by their enemies, they're having these democratic egalitarian processes. It's interesting that the idea of using narratives as a weapon of war in this context is like the pirates were able to spin simultaneous mythologies about themselves for different purposes at different times. So when they're talking to sort of the common people who live under hierarchical colonial capitalism, they're able to push themselves as this sort of utopian Robin Hood democratic thing. And then when they're within earshot of their enemies, the people who are trying to crush them and their ships and their way of life, then they can frame themselves as like tough guy fighters who infinitely bloodthirsty and absolutely dangerous. I don't think we should necessarily look to historic pirates for guidance on how we act in the modern world and like our political projects in the modern world. But I wonder if there is a way to take that sort of logic of like shaping political discourses and narratives of how you're perceived to serve different purposes at different times, to use narratives as a weapon of war, or more accurately, to use narratives as a tool for politics in the modern day. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's going to sound weird, but kind of reminds me of mycorrhizae, you know, the fungus that connects tree roots into a sort of information superhighway under our very feet. The Afrofuturist abolitionists of the Americas, they have like a sort of a piece where they talk about the need for movements to move like mycorrhizae. Before I get into that, I just want to say, of course, that I really don't want people to get us wrong. Like we're not saying, oh, the pirates are these perfect anarchists that so we should emulate and whatever. Like obviously not. They had numerous issues. <laughs> Yeah, especially, I mean, when we talk about egalitarian pirates, we're talking about a very narrow period in time. And then even within that, there's a lot of variation. And brutality was part of the overall picture there. And it's it's tempting when, when we're looking at history to pull little tidbits of stuff that's cool that we might want to apply to downplay or avoid some of the less comfortable parts. But it is definitely the case that for at least some of the pirates, some of the time, there was a type of inhuman brutality that we should not look up to. Yeah. But in a piece about, you know, moving like my Corsi, they basically speak about the need, if I'm remembering correctly, to have sort of two layers to our movement building in our organization, right? And so if we're talking about this idea of narrative building or 
placing a certain image out for the purposes of sort of fooling the powers that be or whatever the case may be. Just the idea of having sort of a double personas. The idea is basically, you know, you have on the above ground, the visible level, you put forward a certain image, you have certain movements and stuff you're doing, certain projects that we're working on, you know, above board, legal, that sort of thing. But then on, on the layer be- below that, you know, you have all the connections between these various projects and movements. You have the connections between those projects and movements and less above board, the sort of the under the table, riskier things. And of course, in that sort of fungus-like connection, that mycorrhizal connection between, you know, these movements and groups, you're going to want to have, you know, a security culture that is able to establish some level of security and safety for the people involved in the projects, both above ground and below ground. And also you want to make sure that there is a level of uh, coordination between these various projects so they can actually move as a unit and and be successful in, in their aims. My mind went to that when I thought of this idea of, you know, pirates putting out a certain post persona for the external purposes while retaining certain internal ideas or functions. I think something similarly can be applied when it comes to movement building. Yeah, there's sort of different audiences for revolutionary politics at different times, right? Like you, we want to be able to meet with and connect with people who are approaching things from different perspectives and, and knowledge bases. It reminds me a little bit also of Especifismo and this sort of idea of having a private smaller group, which is very ideologically oriented around social anarchism. And then you also have wider broad base intervention so you have this this smaller group that is very say like I- ideologically cohesive with their own sort of internal politics their own kind of internal way of talking about the world amongst themselves and then they go out and have larger scale mass politics at the same time it's sort of like you're uh they're, they're facilitators of this mass politics to make sure that the things don't get too far off of the values social insertion sort of thing yeah, so it's not as intense and ideological when you're dealing with the general public, when you're dealing with people who are working their way up the process of political engagement. But the job is to make sure that it's, you know, the thing isn't going to be hijacked by people who are trying to pull it in another direction completely, that people aren't going to start violating core values like ecology, egalitarianism, democracy, or whatever. That's another place that kind of reminds me of that sort of multiple masks of organizing because it's my general tendency is to think of like how do you make one mask that makes everyone happy and serves all of your purposes but maybe that's not always possible or not always desirable yeah i think it's important to apply you know these strategies and tactics tactically it, not every practice will be applicable in every situation one thing that graber mentions in the book and it's kind of a throwaway line In the lies that people told about pirate settlements, he, in parentheses, says something along the lines of, maybe it's possible that all kings are imposters. Gasp. (laughs) I thought that was an interesting idea because there is something to, like, the whole idea of kingship in the first place doesn't really make basic sense. Like, it's not, (laughs) like, like, if someone was just inventing it for the first time, And was like, oh, by the way, like, I'm in charge. Yeah. And uh, I'm in charge now. (laughs) I'm the political leader. And maybe it's because I'm closer to God. Maybe it's not. But in any case, I'm the singular political leader and everyone's below me and kind of all organize around me. That is like a con man's claim in the first place. (laughs) Like, it's like a Homelander speech, you know, I'm stronger, (laughs) I'm smarter, I'm better. You know, it's like, yo, chill, you know. I, I have to imagine that that's what happens in my head when I think about what it must have been like to be the first guy to be like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm just in charge of you all now. Obviously, it didn't quite play out like that. Yeah, because if it but, did, it wouldn't work, right? Yeah. I mean, in a sense, it did, right? Like, I think Salins talks about it. I can't remember in which book, Marshall Salins. I think he talks about the fact that kings... For once, you know, the raiders and the barbarians themselves 
they were just, they kind of set up and were like, okay, so I know I just raided y'all, but I'll protect y'all from other raiders. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. No, there's, it's a, it's a big concept and I'm worried I don't fully understand it, but the concept of stranger Kings is really weaved through the pirate enlightenment book too, which is the Salins idea of like, you have a king whose origin is not from the local population, but from some sort of other population. So there's a variety of w- reasons and ways that this pops up in anthropological history. But I mean, that's kind of how the um, aristocracy or royalty rather ran things in Europe for several centuries. You had the king of England and he spoke French. Your, your Spanish queen might be a Habsburg, some, somebody from Austria or something. Uh, I mean, Grey Balls talks about in Paris Enlightenment, how sojourning foreigners of any sort frequently found themselves asked to mediate local disputes. This idea of outsiders coming in to handle things because they're viewed as not having the biases of local people. I mean, I have to wonder if that sort of justification was also wielded in some instances of the development of monarchy. Totally, yeah. Or and I remember Solins and Graeber have this collaborative book on kings that came out a few years back. And I've read some chunks of it. And one of the anecdotes or stories that came up in it was kind of what I took away from it was this someone showing up in an area who is like very wealthy, who has a bunch of faraway treasures, has a bunch of has a bunch of things that most people don't have is then able to kind of posture themselves too. It's like, I'm very important and I'm from elsewhere. So you should treat me as very important here too. And like that basic social dynamic of someone who seems important showing up <laughs> is a process <laughs> that that is utilized at different points in history for people to enrich themselves and put themselves in a dominant position. Because, you know, people are kind of like, oh, I don't know, he seems important. <laughs> he's He's got all this fancy stuff I've never seen before. He probably is important. <laughs> Maybe he can help us solve our region, our, our local conflicts. Yeah, it's funny to think about. Welcome, ambassadors. Welcome. Uh, have some wine. Have some wine. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yes, yes. Have a seat. Enjoy. Servants, bring these men some food. Okay, so you claim to be ambassadors from this country that you're saying is called Liber... Liberatia? What was it called again? Uh, Libertalia, actually. It's a pirate nation. It's really, really great. Really a, powerful. Yeah, newly settled. A pirate nation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, us and like 40,000 other pirates all got together and we thought, okay, let's found our own civilization. I mean, you know how um, thieves of the seas, you know, they're considered brigands or criminals, but thieves of the land who settle down and set up an army, they're called kings. So we thought that we would settle down in Madagascar, become kings and start our own nation. I see, I see. But, but are you the sort of pirates that have stolen from my nation? <laughs> uh maybe um oh, it's so hard to keep track but yeah. um well that's what we're here about you know we want to end anything like that you know this is the thing is we're on the up and up we used to be kind of wild seafaring pirates in our younger days uh, uh and now we're trying to settle down make some good partnerships and then we'll be like okay well we get a treaty with you okay then we know we're gonna be plundering your rivals we're gonna be leaving you alone i see yeah so it, it's kind of like a win 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 Win, win, win for everyone. Okay. Um, huh. You could set up a post in Madagascar that could help with shipping routes and we could the pirates could protect you. Hmm. Yeah, you know how fearsome pirates are, so our protection. It's, of yeah. course, of course. So you aim to end your piracy. My, my question then is, how are you going to support your fledgling nation? Well, what industry do you seek to establish in these new lands? In other words, how can you be of use to us? Well, look, we've got all kinds of industries Mm -hmm. uh, popping up in Libertalia. It's a big place, and there's a lot of people there. When you see the things we can produce, the the foods, the spices, the gadgets, the... The gizmos. Exactly. We've got mining. We think we've actually discovered a new rock. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a new rock, and we think it actually could be really useful. You know, I'm part of the London Geological Society, and I'd be very interested in studying this rock. 
Oh, well, can you tell me a bit more about it? What does it do? Oh, I'd be. What are its properties? I would love to. It's a highly. Right now, it's one of our national secrets. It's a highly classified new rock. But as partners, if we're making a treaty and stuff, then we could maybe have a geological survey come out, and we'd be happy to show you uh, the new rock that we discovered and some of the other rocks that we're hoping to discover soon. Okay. Okay. Hmm. I'm approaching you with some with some trepidation, but. I, I am interested in some form of partnership between our nations. And I believe that these industries of yours can be quite profitable. Yeah, and you know, pirates are great sailors. Uh, we also make great ships, amazing ships. Uh, those rocks, That's right. we use them to make weapons, uh, like different kinds of cannonballs, mm -hmm. and reinforce things, make them stronger. Really? It also, yeah. it, it works great on crops too. You ground up the rocks to dust and put them on your crops and then they grow better, more dense. Uh, you feed people, the people love you. We've got quite the settlement and we're, we're building a tower. That I'd love to show you. A tower? Yeah, a tower. It's actually a really tall tower. And it's a pirate tower. And where where exactly is, is this Libertalia? Uh, it's on the what would be the eastern coast of Madagascar, kind of the northern south side. and um, Madagascar? Yeah. Yeah, if you have, it's kind of tucked mm. in down there. If you've went past on a ship, you might have missed it. But it's it's there. It's uh, yeah. Oh no, that 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 weather's absolutely dreadful. I prefer the smog of London. We actually think there's a lot of potential for synergy here between London and mm. our liberated pirate community. You know, I know that you're big believers in natural hierarchy over here. We see things in a more egalitarian horizontal way and we is that so we're kind of um kooky i guess you would say but i will certainly be sending my emissaries to make copious notes you don't even have to come out you can also just take our word for it like we're pretty trustworthy yeah we'd be happy to explain in detail after we're partners and we've established sort of the amount of gold to set up that partnership. Mm, I do love gold. Once we settle all that and we get our gold to bring back, then we could sit down with your guys and we could just talk it through, talk the details of our pirate utopian experiment and you could make good records of it and then we could... Um... So let me get this straight. I give you gold now. Correct. And in return, the United Kingdom gets gold back yes more gold than we put in oh yeah yeah absolutely everyone's going to be building wealth from this you me us and then, all of they, us then yeah. you get to be the guy you get to be the mm. wig wearing kind of genius guy who who aligned this all up for your king you know and then the king is going to look at you and say wow this was such a good investment this you know i i know of you to be a skeptical and smart representative of the kingdom. Oh, well. you, <laughs> you have me twirling my mustache here. And he'll just say, you made such a good choice this time, setting up this deal, and now we were getting so much gold out of it. What can I do to raise your status in the world? That's the kind of thing we expect. I do declare, I really do believe that I see some potential for partnership between this United Kingdom and Libertalia. One just, sorry, one final detail is we've, we actually figured out, and you know how us pirates were very strong and tough. A lot of people actually think that rainbows, like rainbows in the sky, are an illusion of light or maybe a sort of twinkle of magic in the world. But we've found through study and through our strength that it's actually a type of animal that can be domesticated with the right pirate strength. Really? Yeah, and we've got a team who have been working... In Madagascar? Yeah, in Madagascar, we've been basically capturing and taming rainbows so they can serve as pets or as work animals. Incredible. Yeah, or they can be put in the zoo. So at the London Zoo, if you want a pet rainbow, then we got to get this deal done now because um, we know that other... I nations are very eager for that other nations you say oh yeah we've been going around europe talking Pray tell, all... ha have you been dilly dally with france <laughs> yeah france france oh, is way up there dear, not the frogs oh, oh, they terrible. want it they wa the, the, you know the french have told us they want it and they were very clear about that but we the said bloody french we, we said look we know the guys over in england they're smart they're critical thinkers they're our first choice, so respectfully, we're going to be speaking to them first. But if they pass up on it, then we're going to have to go to, to France. That's business. Mm. So, so it's a bit time-sensitive, you say? Very time-sensitive. Would you say it's time-sensitive? I would say mm. it's very time-sensitive. Oh, yeah. 
time is of the essence here. If France gets a hold of domesticated rainbows before England does, there's a good chance that England will become a part of France in the future. Yeah, I'm not sure England will exist shortly after that, frankly. Oh dear, the bloody Angevins. Uh, you know what? Confound it, I accept. Hey, great, that's that's amazing, awesome. yeah. Well, if you've got a quill pen, let's ink this up. Let's ink let's, this let's up. Let's ink this one time. And, and let's know, get this... the gold flowing into our pockets. You're making such a good choice here. Hurrah for the king. Yeah. yeah. God yeah, save yeah. the king. God save the king. Another little thing that stuck out in this book is just interesting to me is there's a lot of discussion of magic, in particular love magic, which is like traditional Malagasy understandings of this magical world of people being persuaded or enticed by love magic or punished if they mistreat their partner or they're adulterous. And, and it got me thinking about magic as, an instit- as a social institution. So just working from the assumption that I think it's probably the case there's no spell you can do that will actually get revenge on someone. But maybe there is. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. I think if you both enter a spell in B. <laughs> you could defeat someone in a spelling B as a form of revenge. But it made me think, say like between us, if we had a shared understanding of magic, we're living in community together and we both believe in the same magic at the same time, then that magic becomes a kind of institution that shapes our behavior. And reading the descriptions of, of some of like the revenge love magic and stuff like that in, in chapter two of the book, it kept on occurring to me of like, if the threat of her cursing her husband prevents her husband from being adulterous or or betraying her. So even if there isn't actually an option for me to curse you in the material world, curse you, if we have a shared understanding that I can curse you, that shapes our behavior. We're not doing things that will cause the other one to curse them. So whatever the threshold is that makes it socially acceptable to give someone a, you know, a death curse becomes a meaningful institutional guidepost to our lives. The impression I kind of got is Madagascar had a much, much more lenient sexual mores and, and openness in a lot of ways, but it was deadly serious to betray someone. Yeah, that that caused some conflict, you know, when they pulled up the patriarchal sensibilities of, you know, the newcomers with the relative relaxed you know, sexual practices of the Malagasy. Yeah, there's this fascinating kind of like, he almost describes it as like a back and forth of revolutions and counter-revolutions around gender norms and and the subjugation of women versus the liberation. Like kind of how Malagasy women, because they had end up developing that role as the sort of interceders between the foreigners and the locals, their autonomy and, you know, their ability to assert themselves grew because they had this newfound social power. But then in response to that, sort of as a male backlash, you had some Malagasy men creating their own autonomous sort of circles of conversation, which banned women altogether, which was unheard of, you know, previously in Madagascar, you would have had, you know, those community conversations involved everybody. But now, because the women have developed this this newfound prominence in their social situation, you now have a situation where the guy's like, oh, you know what? We're going to make a no girls allowed <laughs> community meeting. Just guys, boys only, you know, with a little Z instead of an S. What's it called in um, Calvin and Hobbes is gross and it stands for get rid of slimy girls. It's the boys only club. <laughs> but yeah, that that's a real, a real for, and we, you can see it all the time, and in the modern world too. Sometimes I'm kind of blown away by how strong the appeal of misogyny is to men. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing it again, right? To do anytime women are starting to go in a certain direction, it's just this boom. Like someone was was asking me recently about one of those chuds that sort of like is ostensibly left wing or socialist or whatever, but like is like chauvinistic and misogynistic and and someone brought them up to me of like 
why does this exist? Like, why do people act this way? It's like the year 2023. Why is there a self-declared socialist who's just like openly misogynistic? And I was reflecting on that. And it's just like, I don't know, the reality that we have to stand up against here is that there's a lot of, for one reason or another, there's a lot of men, including men who identify as socialists, who identify with a gender hierarchy as a sense of having power in the world. And there's this appeal of being the subjugator that when people feel like they can get away with it, they sometimes do it. And and it's disturbing to look at so directly to recognize that there is this, this disgusting willingness to turn a blind eye to this kind of thing because the prospect of watching women be able to assert themselves and having there be sometimes women who say things that you don't like or act in ways that you don't like or come to conclusions you wouldn't come to is so upsetting to men who maybe they have a type of insecurity or maybe they have like this maybe even letting them off the hook maybe there's a real malice like maybe there's a real hatred yeah like insecurity is almost like oh poor guy he's insecure but it's not that there's a real ma- like that that's one of the factors but there's a real malice too and when, I, when I'm reading this story and I'm looking about these histories of these reactions and revolutions and back and forth and dialogue, and I see so much of our modern day in it, in places where, I don't know, it's really, it's brutal how much this carries in the modern day. And like, and pirates, um, you know, there's examples of pirates who were women, but again, looking at the big picture on pirates, they were a force of, of gender reaction. I believe in the book, there's anecdotes of how pirates, despite this egalitarianism on their ships, perhaps contributed to the, you know, the gendered counter reaction, reaction to the gender, gendered liberation stuff in Madagascar. It was considered to be bad luck to sail with women as pirates. There's actually a lot of places in history where you can find a something that's very egalitarian in many ways, impressively egalitarian in many ways, but then fails some basic test of human decency and egalitarianism elsewhere. Yeah, I agree 100%. Another thing that he highlights in the book that I found particularly interesting with the sort of the connection between these sort of faraway pirate settings and historical contexts with our modern factory discipline. That was something that was developed on ships and on plantations. You know, this idea of turning these people into these cogs for the whims of people at the top. So the pirate legends and stuff that we think about and talk about that gained so much popularity and had such an effect on the conversations at the time and to this day, it's sort of a radical expression of the yearning for freedom that many working people had expressed, you know, that sailors who were under the regimes of their actual captains had to deal with and had thought about as alternatives and would share stories about. Also, the exploitation of the enslaved population in the Caribbean helped to lay the groundwork for the budding Industrial Revolution. The first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. Eric Williams, in his book, Capitalism and Slavery, In addition to pointing to the fact that the abolition of slavery was not a benevolent act, there were economic motivations for it. He also developed the idea that the slave plantations in the New World were pretty much the first factories. The enslaved population in the Caribbean and in, you know, the Americas as a whole, really, they were the first proletariat. The techniques of mechanization and surveillance and discipline were applied first on the plantation and first on the ships and then came to be applied to the factories of the so-called old world and to the factories of the industrial revolution. I mean, the golden age of piracy really only lasted about 40 or 50 years and yet people still continue to tell stories about to this day and the situations that occurred, the conversations that developed in that period continue to affect us. To this day. Yeah, it's totally fascinating to think about this global colonial ship faring era where you have these enormous ships that are just the most advanced technology of the time. And they are places where there is total subjugation 
of the crew under a captain. We have these ideas, these harsh, punitive, hierarchical ideas developing in practice around the world through this global colonization and through experiencing kind of the day-to-day logic of living with enslaved people as a key sort of economic function of your society. There's a big thing in humanity in it, that a society that comes out of that will need to resolve that our society very clearly has not resolved. You know, you can't build a whole society built on the subjugation of an entire racial class and just get rid of that system in some forms, not even entirely, but in some forms, and just say, oh, well, you know, that's it then. You know, kind of continue and expect to create any sort of healthy society. I mean, what else could come out of it other than even more poison, even more rot? Yeah, just the same. and the ideas that go into sustaining that, in order to live with that and participating in that, there's all of this toxic, almost like this infection of the logic that then permeates through other aspects of society as well. I almost imagine like these creeping roots just infecting everything, just getting this idea or this really harsh, punitive, hierarchical, twisted idea of like above and below, poisoning everything and just putting these like horrible roots that later become the theoretical basis of disciplined factory systems. In the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ibrahim X. Kendi talks about the Spanish king's personal biographer. Because Spain was making so much money off of the slave trade at the same time they wanted to claim they were good, the Spanish King's biographer invented this idea that slavery was necessary because the people who were enslaved needed to be helped and that it was like bringing them closer to God. And then Ibrahim X. Kendi connects that as sort of one of the originating ideas on anti-Black racism. So they had this economic reason to basically lie and say that this is all <laughs> this is all for everyone's own good. We're all moving in the light of God. And the reason that we have to claim this is because we're making so much money off of the slave trade. We're bringing in more money through the slave trade than we actually make through taxation. So this global context of thinking about these factory ships moving around the world, spreading these toxic, toxic ideas on behalf of the dominant ideology, but then also this counterforce that was present even then and is also, I think, present now, that takes the form of things like marinage, pirates, indigenous resistance. It's fascinating in how this unfolded this way, how this sort of ricochet of ideas and experiences unfolded from the early modern period till today and some of the socially damaging common sense that you see in in, in our day-to-day life as well. It's like what Bookchin talks about with the legacy of domination and the legacy of freedom. Uh, it, It makes me think of how we can pull on that legacy of freedom from pirates, from slave resistors, from indigenous resistors to strengthen our politics and and be resilient and push against the kind of twisted logic that you can see sort of creeping through all of these economic and and political forces of the age of uh age of piracy from dominant institutions. Yeah, and I think it's it really starts in conversation, not just between people, but between, you know, cultures, between historical lineages and contexts and conversation between lived realities. You know, I mean, the Enlightenment was, in a lot of ways, you know, about conversation, you know, where, as Graeber says, it was an age of intellectual synthesis, where previously intellectual backwaters like England and France suddenly found themselves at the center of global empires and exposed to startling new ideas, trying to integrate them for the first time, you know, the first exposure to ideals of individualism and liberty drawn from the Americas, a new conception of the bureaucratic nation state largely inspired by China, African contract theories, and Islamic economic and social theories. You know, and this this conversation between ideas is also something that's practical, you know, it's something that took place in salons and coffee houses. A sort of a prose style was developed between people as they got into these conversations. And of course, m- most of those conversations are not in the historical record. But, you know, you have to imagine 
the sort of ideas were being exchanged at the time and the fact that we see hints of it in certain experiments, including the political experiment of the Betsy Masaryka Confederation. Enlightenment thought gets associated with, and rightly in many cases, that process of global domination and hegemony and the self-interestness and the brutal and violent and inhumane indifference of the colonizer. But this, this what you're talking about of all these global influences on some of the ideas that became the common sense of the Enlightenment, there's a liberatory thread as well. And I, I think maybe the clearest example of that liberatory thread is something like the French Revolution, where you have, despite many issues and aspects of it that are less than perfectly utopian, at the same time, you see this real political movement founded in conversations that happened in salons that were mostly organized by women in France, where ideas were spread that challenged the existing order and then eventually fermented this explosion, this bottom-up explosion of social energy and democratic power that eventually overthrew a king and created a sort of new common sense around freedom, equality, dialogue, and so on, which we can trace how these things come from around the world, that these ideas of freedom in the French Revolution had some historical lineage through conversations that started in the New World with indigenous groups like the Wendat and Kendi Aronk, or Muskrat, the Wendat leader whose dialogues are described in detail in the dawn of everything. Yeah. Or this sense of dialogue being this thing where truth can sort of find its footing and lies can fade away through the process of dialogue is something that has some lineage that can be traced to Madagascar. Between Dawn of Everything, Pirate Enlightenment, There Never Was a West, this kind of big narrative about the Enlightenment is a period where the world's ideas were bouncing off of each other and there was like the new synthesis being made. The more evidence that I see collected for it, the more it just clicks as what happened then. Like, why did ideas change so much in that period? It's because all the ideas were bouncing off each other, being brought together in dialogue for the first time. And it makes you think about what the potentials are now in the global internet-enabled world that we're in, with every corner of the world now able to speak to each other at a higher degree than before, and with new, new technology around translation, information, communications technology that we... We want to be in an enlightenment of our own, basically. Exactly. Or we have the potential to, if we try to. Yeah. For sure. Welcome to America's Pirate Kitchen, the only American cooking show that teaches you real pirate recipes each and every week. We are going to be doing some classic pirate recipes. We've got your pirate gruel. We've got your pirate hardtack and to drink the pirate grog. The audience is so excited, we're so excited, and we just love cooking and eating together here on this show, don't we? That's right, so I'm gonna get started on the grog. This is a traditional pirate grog recipe, and I'll just pour in some rum into this container here, and then we're gonna water that down. And we're gonna spice this with a little bit of lime, helps prevent scurvy, and a touch of molasses. I guess our pirates were lucky enough to come into some molasses recently. And put it to the side. Alongside that, we're gonna be cooking up our pirate gruel, also called burgoo. It's a super simple recipe, very easy. You get some of your oatmeal here, you measure that out. Put that in your pot with a whole bunch of water, probably more water than you'd normally want to, because you want to make a thin gruel to make sure that you're stretching those oats as far as possible. And then you can add salt, sugar, and or butter, kind of depending on what's on your pirate ship out there, mateys. Here we're going to add a little bit of each, but not too much because, you know, rations are spread thin. Now that's looking like a nice thin pirate gruel. Mm, yeah, I can't wait to dip our hardtack in that gruel. And finally, to complete the trifecta, you know, when sailors or pirates are going out to sea for a long period of time, they need food that's going to last. So one of the things that they would cook was often called hardtack or sea biscuit. And I'm not talking about Tobey Maguire in Sea Biscuit, the horse film. Common mistake, yeah. So what I'm going to do is get this flour and mix it up with some water here and a touch of salt. 
And what we're going to do is bake that repeatedly until it becomes very, very hard. Uh, and that way it'll last for months and months as long as it doesn't get wet. Oh, and poke holes in it too. You want to poke holes to make sure that the it doesn't puff up when you're baking it. You want to keep that density. That's right. And we're doing authentic pirate weevil infused hardtack today. So uh, it was a common complaint of sailors at sea. Hardtack would often become infested with bugs. To give that authentic seafaring pirate experience, what we've got here is a glass jar of living weevils. This is a type of bug. Bitter. Uh, people don't like to eat it, but they had to. Once we've cooked this hardtack, we're going to sprinkle on some live weevil to get the full experience. Yeah, we don't want to put those in before we cook it because then they'll be dead. And, you know, authentic pirate weevil, they, they would still be living infested in the biscuit. So we do want to add them after it's been baked. Now that this is stirred up, I'm just going to slide this into the oven. And this is something we're going to be baking and rebaking. Yeah, so we're going to be here for a while. So anything new with you? Any new recipes you're thinking of trying? Or... Oh, yeah. No, I've, there's this new spaghetti place right around the corner. And the whole crew basically went and went there for lunch. Yeah, we, we all went there. Yeah, didn't you came with us, didn't you? I no, think no, was, I didn't uh, actually. Secret... No, I oh. was standing right there and everyone was talking about it and no one invited me. So I just went to the lunchroom and I just ate the sandwich. Oh, so you chose not to come? Well, I wouldn't say I chose huh. not to come. It was more like I wasn't invited. Well, you could have came along. You know, we, well, you know, standing it was open right to there, everybody. I'm trying to make eye contact with you when you're talking about it and you know you're extroverted and i'm just standing there and i'm thinking oh my god he's not going to invite me and then he didn't and then i didn't get invited and i mean i guess that's life you know i do love spaghetti and i'm sorry do. but i mean i didn't specifically invite anyone but like we all kind of decided to go and everyone just went you know it's hard being an extrovert everyone expects you to like specifically cater to them and know what they're thinking and make bring them out of their shells i can't bring everybody on the crew out of their shell every day well, I'm sorry, but you know I love spaghetti. I'm standing right there. Sure, do you have to invite me? Are the police going to come and arrest you for not inviting me? No. It's just basic conscientiousness. I think the little nod I gave you was basically an invite. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. You know I'm self-conscious about inviting myself places. That's, that's one of my anxiety triggers. Maybe I'll do it. I'll just become a shepherd of introverts and I'll move you around. I'll have my shepherd stick, my pole, and I'll say, hey, sheep, you know, you're invited this way. Come with me and I'll I'll make sure to round them all up and not leave anyone behind because, you know, God forbid one of the flock might actually have to make a decision for themselves and just come along with the group. You knew you were invited. The whole crew's invited. We go to lunch regular. You don't need a specific invite every single time. Well, it looks like our hard tack is done. Let's pull it out. And look at that. Ooh, that is tough. I don't think you could bite into that. You'd have to dip it into some liquid. I'm going to tap it on the, the table here. Listen to this. That is hard. Now let's add the finishing little touch here. Some live weevils. You ready um, to try our pirate feast? Absolutely. Yeah, here. You want to tap our hard tacks together like uh, like we're toasting or something? Yeah, here. And then I'll dip it in the burgoo. Yeah, I'm going to do a little dip, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, really hard. This is yeah, really hard, really bland. Yeah, that'll keep you alive. Um, we'll wash that down with some grog. Oh, a little weevil caught in my teeth. Yeah, there's bitter. That's bitter. I know why they complained about these mm. weevils. Yeah. I'm going to put my um, hard tack down here and see if we can get it to walk. Uh, it moved a bit. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit heavy for those weevils, I think. Just heavy, heavy like the burden of having to shepherd introverts everywhere. Oh, please. I, I feel you, weevils. Can we let it go? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to bring it up again. It just... Well, thank you for inviting me to eat this meal with you for once. You're using your extrovert privilege for good. I commend you. Pirate Enlightenment by David Graeber. I really enjoyed reading the book. Definitely a, a worthy addition to the catalog and, and this larger argument that Graeber's been building over some of his pieces about the uh, bottom-up enlightenment, you know, the people's history of the enlightenment. Yeah, and I think um, part of the beauty in Graeber's whole approach to this particular book is that, I mean, he admits that a lot of stuff, he doesn't have all the facts for all the, the sources, Apache at best in some areas, and uh, some things are unknowable. 
I think there is some beauty to be found in our speculations and interpretations of what we can do, you know, particularly when we make the conscious effort to speculate and to investigate and to explore outside of dominant ideologies, outside of dominant cultures, outside of dominant ways of knowing and understanding and interpreting the world. When we step outside of this so-called, you know, Western canon and look into the many, many, many different ways that humans have thought about themselves, organized themselves, and lived in their various environments, the ways we have interacted with strangers with, and with family and with friends and with community, I think it really opens our eyes to a lot more of our potential than we are typically allowed to realize. Yeah, there's a, the cliche of, you know, history is is written by the victors. And you, you can see that when reading about history, there's all this missing information because it's written by the dominant powers. It's focused on discoveries by individuals who are considered great, you know, in the dominant society. This great man did this and it created this. And that's how history flows in the, the dominant historical narrative. And that's one of the things that's so cool about the the sort of history from below premise like these you have to kind of read between the lines sometimes and and graber ends up doing that quite a bit here just from a lack of evidence uh, a lack of direct evidence to work with but the stories that you can see the things that we can see from the little bits of evidence that we do have always tell such fascinating stories about how people lived and thought. Uh, and it's it's such a worthy pursuit, I feel like. Every time I read a book that is in the, the sort of category of like history from below, like, you know, a people's history, a decolonized history, a, a, a history that's rooted in the experiences of common people rather than, you know, great leaders or military conquests and stuff. That stuff's really, really uh, mind-blowing. And yeah, I, I thought this, this book was great. There was some uh, it's a short book. Uh, it there's there's some parts that short by Graeber standards, of course. Yeah, yeah, and and there's also parts that get I think just to be slightly critical. There's some parts that are a little more dry than others, and you're learning a lot of like new people, and you're learning about new people and different groups in this really rapid succession. And I ended up having to reread sections of it multiple times to really understand what was going on, but. The points that are made in the book are so fascinating. I think I probably would suggest that if someone is interested in pirates and wants an introduction to look to Villains of All Nations by Marcus Redeker first as a more accessible book. I say that with no disrespect to Graeber. This expands on some of those ideas and provides more context in a really fascinating way as well. In closing, I think there's one thing that I really want people to keep in mind that I drew from this book is that politics and the political awakenings and discussions and revolutions that took place in this era in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, they are the result of conversation, of approaching the social and intellectual problems of our time from multiple perspectives, trying from multiple viewpoints and experiences and cultures in order to develop solutions. Of course, many of these solutions did not end up being implemented. Uh, many of them were ruthlessly crushed. But I think the potential that exists whenever cultures collaborate rather than clash is inspiring, leaves a lot of room for the flourishing of the species as a whole. Definitely. Yeah. No, uh, well said. Well, yeah, thanks for coming uh, on our show to talk about this book with us, Andrew. This, is, this has been killer. Maybe we should do the thing, the podcast thing of telling the audience where to find more of your stuff, your videos and, and all that. Where can people find you? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so people can find me on youtube.com slash andrewism, A-N-D-R-E-W-I-S-M. And I'm technically on Twitter, but not really, at underscore St. Drew. And they can also support me on patreon.com slash St. Drew. All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you soon. Bye now. Adios. Bye. Next time on Seriously Wrong, Sean, Aaron, and Andrew become futuristic pirates. 
All right, fellas, this is the biggest heist of our lifetime. Multinational corporations are shipping cricket protein across the barren climate landscape. But if we get on our little pirate hover scooters, surround them, we can seize the shipments and redistribute it to the people. Sounds good. I'm right behind you. We've been preparing for this for weeks. We have the skills. We have the know-how. It's going to be a breeze. We got this. Isn't it interesting how like it used to be that pirates would have like an eye patch because of the tough work conditions on ships and stuff like that? But now we have these like cool eye scanner things like Dragon Ball Z that can read data on things and it kind of looks like an eye patch like isn't that an interesting kind of historical circularity i don't know i was just thinking that what's what's a dragon ball z i'm from the future i don't know what that is oh it's this amazing old show i'll send you the files i pirated all the episodes and i think you can even play it on the inside of your eye patch thing you pirated it sounds a bit on the nose i like to watch dragon ball z on my little eye patch thing while i do raids You know, some people say that it's distracting, but I actually find that having that distraction helps me really focus on the work of plundering and looting. It's like listening to a podcast when you're at work. And yeah, plundering and looting, isn't that what it's all about at the end of the day? I mean, there's the egalitarian stuff, and obviously we're fighting for freedom, and uh, we're trying to build a world pirate utopia. But plundering and looting, it's just uh, something about it. Of course... We are distributing the loot to the people, so it is noble and morally justified. Yeah, it's like a Robin Hood type looting, you know, we're stealing from the rich corporations and then handing it out uh, to the people. Who's Robin Hood? Oh, kids these days, man, they they barely download any ancient media and watch it on their eye patches. Oh, we'll show you Robin Hood too. It's great. great. He's not quite a pirate, but you know, I, I think there's a real pirate spirit there. 